हाई एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग सो लाइक अरुण सेड आई एम हेयर टू टॉक अबाउट यू नो के स्टडी दिस इज इसेंशली बेस्ड ऑन आर एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ इंप्रूविंग परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ आर रिएक्ट ऐप सो मोर स्पेसिफिकली वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट द क्लाइंट साइड रेंडिंग और द सी एस आर पार्ट ऑफ द रिएक्ट परफॉर्मेंस दैट वी इम्प्रूव एंड वी गोइंग टू लुक एट सम ऑफ द लो हैंगिंग फ्रूट्स इन टर्म्स ऑफ इम्प्रूविंग द परफॉर्मेंस द काइंड ऑफ गेम्स दैट यू कैन डू इन अ फ्यू वीक्स दैट कैन ब्रिंग इन नोटेबल इम्प्रूवमेंट टू यू नो ऑल योर स्पीड मेट्रिस ओके so before we talk about it here's a little bit about myself uh, so i'm punit sethi uh, i've been working on uh, software performance for a decade uh, uh, right from measuring performance to profiling and uh, tuning and optimization and all that stuff uh, since the last couple of years uh, i founded tesify where we uh, do front end performance optimization and we have a couple of products uh, uh, specifically around uh, uh, tracking and monitoring uh, web performance okay so on to our uh, case study uh, so here's a little bit about the react app uh, that we kind of uh, optimize for performance uh, so this was react 16 mention this here because we use some of the react 16 specific features which we'll talk about uh, webpack 4 was used for the uh, build purposes again we use some of the presets and plugins that are specific to webpack 4 uh, all of the css was uh, css in js uh, style components Uh, and most of the images were SVG, so this was not a, a image-heavy web app, so as to say. Uh, so I'm mentioning this to highlight that most of our, uh, uh, you know, roots was consumed by JavaScript. So that is what we were focusing on optimizing uh, in this particular uh, uh, app. Um, and yes, 80% of the traffic for uh, our app essentially. Uh, was coming from mobile devices in india so we kept that in mind when we were measuring the performance before and after the optimization okay all right so before we get into the meat of uh, what are the kind of optimizations we put in and how we went about it uh, we'll just look at uh, how we or what are the performance goals we set and why did we set them Uh, so this is essentially to help you understand how we kind of ensured that our uh, optimization exercise was very focused by you know sticking to certain goals that were measurable okay so this was the performance goal that we had in mind we wanted to reduce the speed index for sessions first visit for the top 3 entry routes Uh, we also picked the mobile device on which we would kind of measure the performance moto g4 relatively lower end uh, mobile device uh, fast 3g network from mumbai location so we went ahead and kind of you know knew what speed measure we cared about uh, under what conditions we were kind of measuring uh, that particular measure and why did we pick these so you know uh, this gives a, an idea of uh, why we picked these specific uh, uh, you know uh, things uh, so speed index this was essentially a discussion between the dev and business as to what is the single metric that matters the most uh, this wasn't the only metric that we cared about but this was the top most uh, we'll look at another that we looked at later uh, we were looking at sessions first visit because uh, single page apps are all essentially about the first hit where your spa code gets loaded the later hits are obviously a lot faster always uh, we're looking at top 3 entry routes uh, because these form 90% of our uh, you know uh, entry this was coming from google analytics uh, uh, moto g4 again we pick because majority of traffic like i said was coming from mobile devices this is a relatively lower end device if you improve for this you improve obviously for a lot of other mobile devices um, fast 3g network this was based on our experience you know all of us use geo 4g but in terms of speed quality it is equivalent to a fast 3g network and uh, mumbai location because all of our traffic was coming from uh, india so we used these measures and we then used web page test uh, to set these up and kind of take our measurements okay so like i said we also kept an eye on the time to interactive measurement other than the speed index and we also did not want uh, speed index for some of the other routes to degrade while we were just focusing on the three that i kind of mentioned earlier okay so that's how we determined that here's this goal that we'll kind of constantly watch as we uh, 
you know, optimize uh, our app. Okay, and then we went ahead and took a baseline performance. Uh, so these were the three routes that we were tracking, register, view scorecard, and purchase. And under all the conditions that we just looked at in, uh, you know, a co last couple of slides, we measured what were the timings using web page test. Uh, you know, so from uh, Mumbai location, fast 3G, Moto G4, uh, all those things. Uh, and these were the timings, eight seconds, 11 and a half, 8.5 before we started. So we knew where we were in terms of one timing. Second thing we captured as baseline is the amount of JavaScript that was loading for these three routes. So like I already mentioned, uh, you know, majority of uh, the stuff that get lo that got loaded when the routes were, uh, you know, hit was JavaScript. So we measured the amount of JavaScript that was loaded when, you know, someone would hit, for example, uh, registration route. Uh, so before the speed index event would occur, 478.5 KB gzip. So these, these are these all numbers are gzip. Most of the numbers that I've talked going ahead are all gzip. Wherever it isn't, I've explicitly mentioned and I'll explicitly let you know. Okay. So we got these numbers in terms of the amount of JavaScript that was loading. This obviously you can do from uh, Chrome's dev tools. And thirdly, uh, we got a good view of. Uh, uh, you know, how our uh, JS bundles look like through Webpack bundle analyzer. So uh, for folks who would have uh, looked at Webpack bundle analyzer, I think uh, uh, it's one of the best tools for you to get a real quick view of some of the low hanging fruits, uh, you know, when you do a, an optimization exercise. So this kind of tells you what constitutes that 478 KB that we just saw in the earlier slide. And then you start questioning, why do I see this here? I don't access this here and so on and so forth. Okay. So we, we took these three, took note of these three things before we kind of started our work. And yeah, so then we came into the optimization. So that's the meat of, you know, what we did, but it's important to understand and realize that, uh, all the pre-work is kind of necessary to keep the exercise very goal uh, oriented and thus bring in, uh, you know, measurable gains. Okay, so onto the optimizations. So here's the list of optimizations. Here's the what that we did. Um, we identified and removed unused code. We uh, identified and removed any duplicate libraries. We did code splitting. Uh, we did some of the dynamic library loading. Uh, we use, uh, you know, we use a lot of plugins and uh, presets, but uh, one worth mentioning here is the Babel preset ENV that we use. Uh, and we did some of the optimizations beyond the app code, which we'll also look at. So the slides going ahead, will talk about uh, how we did these, uh, okay, how we did these optimizations and what kind of gain uh, came from each of these. Okay, so the first one, unused code. So this essentially, I mean, very simply is about not loading the code that is never used. It makes sense, right? Don't load the code that you're not going to use because any code, any JavaScript that is there within your bundle is one getting downloaded, is getting passed and is getting compiled, even if it is not used. And these three things have a substantial cost on your mobile devices. It may not appear so when you're testing, uh, you know, on your desktops while doing the dev work, but the moment you look at these, uh, on your mobile devices, connect it with an actual device, set up remote debugging uh, on dev tools, and you will see that these are having an impact. Okay, so how did we uh, uh, remove or identify this code and remove it? Essentially using Webpack bundle analyzer. So the, uh, essentially we reduce our vendor bundle by uh, 80 KB gzip, uh, around 20 odd percent. So we'll look at uh, you know a few examples of the kind of changes we did. First is a real low hanging fruit in the optimization circle, uh, something that you should look at right away. So let me just, before talking about this code snippet, let me show you the Webpack bundle analyzer view. So this is how our bundle analyzer view look like uh, when we started, right? Uh, and you can see what I've kind of highlighted in red here. So we saw that moment was loading all the locales. Uh, I can clearly see Russian and AF and I, I don't know, a lot of other locales. We definitely knew that our app was English only. So we were certain that we are not even using all these locales. I think this was 50 KB gzip. So a massive uh, amount of uh, JS that was, you know, loading needlessly. 
So to remove this, we used a Webpack plugin, Moment Locales Webpack plugin, like you're seeing here. This went into the Webpack config.js. We just wanted uh, a single locale, the English locale to uh, stay. And this essentially brought in, I think, around 40 to 50 KB gzip uh, reduction in our bundle. So a very low-hanging fruit. It's one of the first things that uh, you know anyone and everyone should do. If you're using moments, just make sure you're not using locales. If, of course, you know you are not, uh, uh, your app isn't uh, internationalized. So just just be careful about that. Uh, second thing, uh, this is a smaller gain, but every app that I've worked on, uh, I've seen Redux Logger already always part of the production JS bundle. Uh, but we all know that Redux Logger we use essentially for all the uh, dev-related debugging, right? So the kind of code snippet that you're seeing here is something that's probably present in most of the, at least every app that I've kind of worked with, is you do a static import of Redux Logger, okay? And then you use it if your environment is non-production because you just want to log all the, you know, Redux state changes and uh, uh, do all the debugging around it. So what happens in this particular case is that the Redux logger library is always included, whether in production or in dev, but it is used only in dev. We never use it in production. So we don't want to do this import. This is a static import that we're doing here. So what we did in our case, and is recommended you know, way to go for this, is to use dynamic import. So we brought the import of Redux logger inside a function we just created a function load redux logger where we would import this and do all the stuff related to it here. And we made this call only when the environment was non-production. So this ensured that we are not even importing a redux logger, uh, you know, when the environment is non-production, uh, is production, sorry. Okay, so this is uh, another thing to kind of, you know, always keep in mind, just remove this kind of unused code uh, that may go into your production JS bundles. Okay, Redux forms, again, uh, you know, one of the things. So the way we did imports for Redux forms was not by using the ES modules. Uh, so when we looked at, uh, you know, our Webpack bundle analyzer view, the Redux form library was kind of relatively big. And we were not using uh, that many controls. That made us kind of, you know, try to... Uh, uh, analyze as to why we were seeing so many of the Redux form controls in our JS bundle, which we were not even using. Uh, so we realized that, like I said, you know, we were not using the you know, ES form of the Redux forms. Uh, now, rather than going and manually changing all those imports, we decided to use Babel plugin transform imports. What this guy does is that it changes those imports from, uh, you know, just the Redux form import to the E ES equivalent uh, import of it. What this does is it makes sure that only, and of course you do the prevent full import as true, so this makes sure that you're just importing, uh, um, you know, the controls that uh, are used on, you know, that particular uh, route or screen. I think this was around 15 or KB, 15, somewhere between 15 to 20 KB gzip reduction. Okay, and uh, yeah, so this, this one is kind of, uh, you know, lazy but common. So uh, our uh, app essentially started, we picked up React boilerplate from GitHub, and we then built, uh, like everyone, you know, we picked either CRA or some sort of boilerplate and then built on top of it. Uh, so we picked, we had picked React boilerplate, and uh, the boilerplate already had in place Redux Saga related uh, imports and, uh, you know, all the skeleton code in place. It had all the internationalization code in place. We were actually using Redux Thunk. We were not even using Saga, but it was kind of just left because, you know, uh, who would kind of touch something uh, if you don't know what that is kind of scenario. So I would say when you are picking up a boilerplate, just make sure that uh, you get rid of the parts of boilerplate that you are not using. So in our Webpack bundle analyzer, we we're seeing React internationalization. This is React INTL, pretty small, so just letting you know. Uh, and uh, this was uh, Redux Saga. So we saw this and we were, we were sure that, oh, we are not even using Saga, we are not even doing any sort of internationalization. So that's where we kind of just went ahead and just, just removed those imports and deleted that skeleton code to get rid of this. Uh, 
Yeah. So those are the kind of uh, you know. Uh, so those is, those are some of the ways where we remove the unused code. So the way is to look at uh, the bundle analyzer view and question yourself as to where is this being used or is this being used at all? Okay. So the second kind of optimization that we did is we look for duplicate libraries. Uh, some of you guys who have a seasoned eye for bundle analyzer would have already seen that. Uh, you know, in our vendor bundle, the immutable JS is appearing two times. Uh, so something of this sort, uh, you know, for a performance freak is actually criminal because you're including something two times, double the size, double all the cost that I talked about. Uh, so we went ahead and analyzed why this was happening. Uh, this typically happens when there's a difference in the version in, uh, you know, the de dependencies. So we were using, uh, I don't remember which of these, but we were using, I think, 3.8.2 within our dependencies. And one of the libraries that we were using had 4.0 as its dependency. And thus, we ended up having two immutable JS, uh, you know, soaking up all, uh, taking up all the space within our vendor bundle. Uh, the way out was we changed our code to make sure we were using the same version as our, one of our, you know, libraries was using. And thus we reduced, uh, I think 17 KB gzip. So we basically just got rid of one of these two and uh, that was a 17 KB gzip reduction. Okay, code splitting. So uh, this, I mean, reduction and uh, duplicate library is all very lucrative because you can get rid of stuff that you don't want, but there's always so much that you can do there, right? And then comes code splitting. Uh, so. Code splitting essentially is about avoiding to load components until they are needed. Uh, a lot of times we load a lot of things right at the beginning. We may sometimes not need them or may need them a lot later. So that's what code splitting essentially tries to identify. The way to go about identifying these opportunities is to look for conditional rendering of components. Okay. In our case, uh, we will look at example to understand how that happens in our case. Uh, here we lazy loaded four components so we you know benefited from it uh, i think at four different places we got our total reduction by 90 kb gzip this was pretty decent i think 23 percent that's one fourth the size so yeah pretty helpful so we'll look at one of the examples of uh, the code splitting that we did to understand uh, you know how it uh, can be used so this is how our code looked like uh, before doing the code splitting so this is for our scorecard view. So you know there there is a scorecard view where scorecard is supposed to appear for that particular user. However, if the user is in certain stage, which is update here. So you know so if a user hasn't updated all his data, then we want to show him a form called info update form. So that is how this functionality is set up here, right? If the stage is update, show him the info update form. Else, just forget it. Uh, however the import is again static. What this means is that the scorecard JS bundle always includes the info update form related code, whether it is shown to the user or not displayed to the user. So that's exactly what we want to avoid more so in this case, because we identified that we actually showed this form, I think around two to three percent of the times it was so the P user not having filled all the data was pretty rare case. So we were showing, or uh, we were loading uh, a certain amount of code that was needed only for 2% of the guys. So rest 98% were kind of loading that needlessly. Okay. So how did we code split this? So this is how we did this. We used React's lazy and suspense capability. This came in with React 16. Uh, so we changed the static import that we saw earlier. Uh, through react lazy we encapsulate the import within the lazy what this does is that it essentially will download this particular component related js only when this condition would happen so this component and its dependencies would not be part of the scorecard related js and would get loaded separately what suspense does is that it provides you a mechanism to specify what to display while this dynamic downloading may be happening. Okay. So in this way, what we wanted to do and what we achieved is that when a user sees scorecard, the info update form and its dependencies would not load 
unless this is true. Okay. So yeah, so React Lazy, like I said, you know, it is essentially used uh, to do a dynamic import uh, as a it, just just for dev convenience, as a, show it as a regular import and suspense is to specify the fallback content to show when uh, you know the lazy loaded content is uh, loading. Uh, for guys who are working on earlier versions of React. Uh, React loadable and loadable components are the alternatives. They are pretty feature rich. So if you cannot use React lazy and suspense, you still can do code splitting. One another point that I'd like to mention around uh, code splitting uh, as to when to or how to identify when to code split is one like we talked is to look for conditional rendering. But that's not all. We need to actually do the code splitting and see how much of benefit it is bringing because a lot of times you can, uh, well, uh, let me put it this way, you can actually increase the total of amount of JS that is loading if you don't get this right. So this diagram, I'll just try to show this. So let's assume there's one particular JS uh, bundle that has three components and uh, you know all its dependencies. Now let's say if I go ahead and uh, code split component two, you know, I just see that this is being rendered conditionally like I showed and we code split component two. What will happen here is that this JS bundle will just remove component two, but not library three related code because it's also needed by component one. And the separate bundle that will be formed will have component two plus library three. So you would want to analyze how much of gain you are making or you know lack of gain you are making by actually code splitting. Because a lot of times, I mean, the dependencies are not as simple and as clear as it is you know, shown in this diagram. So it's always advisable to code split. So if I would have done code splitting for component three, it would have been relatively simple. The three and library four would have been reduced from this particular JS bundle, and uh, it would be you know loaded as a separate bundle. So the best way to do this is code split, and then actually hit that root and see within DevTools what is the JS being uh, is being loaded, what is the size of that JS. Look at it in the Webpack bundle analyzer. Okay. So that's uh, code splitting. Uh, another thing we did is dynamic library loading. Um, so our app had uh, provides customer support related, uh, you know, uh, icon, and then when the user clicks that uh, icon, he can chat with, uh, you know, our customer support. Uh, now we were using we use third party library to do this, uh, which is I think around 52 KB gzipped with all its dependencies. Uh, this is how we were using it earlier. Uh, we built a wrapper, a small wrapper chat. Uh, client uh, uh, which we were importing in our let's say scorecard root okay and then once the scorecard uh, component uh, was loaded we would do all the chat initialization okay now what we realized is that uh, we needed the customer support chat to be initialized only after the app is displayed only once the speed index has happened right however in this case with the chat related code bundled with my overall vendor thing, we were actually loading it before the speed index was happening, uh, which was unnecessary. So what we did is we actually consciously delayed loading of this library. So we removed the static import that uh, you know you were seeing here. We used set timeout, the good old set timeout. Uh, to you know, happen four seconds after my scorecard would be loaded. So this four second was agreed upon by you know, of course, talking to a lot of people. But uh, what we ensured is that uh, our chat client would and its dependencies would load four seconds. So it would give a four second breather to for our actual app to uh, you know get rendered and become functional and become interactive. Okay, so uh, these kind of changes are good. I mean, when you kind of look at it from the bigger picture as to why this is being loaded right now kind of thing, it uh, can definitely, you know, bring in such insights as how to uh, optimally load, uh, you know, some of these kind of libraries. Okay, uh, Babel preset ENV. Uh, uh, yeah, like I said, a lot of plugins and uh, presets we can use. Babel preset ENV I've just mentioned because it is kind of relatively powerful. Now, uh, we all understand that there's a lot of polyfill code that becomes part of our JS bundle when uh, you know we uh, do the builds, but not always we need all that polyfill code. 
what Babel uh, preset ENV does it is that it allows us to specify for what destination browser uh, uh, you know uh, versions we want our build to run and thus uh, we can avoid a lot of needless polyfill. Uh, in our case, we couldn't agree to what browsers we wanted to support and not support till you know we did this exercise. So we didn't do that part, but we used this interesting uh, feature from Babel preset ENV, which is the use built-ins. So use built-ins essentially allows you to specify uh, where that polyfill code would go into your you know the JS bundle. Would it be so? Typically, it is part of the initial vendor bundle. Uh, however, a lot of JS for uh, the uh, you know uh, for that polyfill is sitting in a lot of later uh, routes so use built in usage allows you to ensure that the polyfill for a certain code is only part of that particular js and is not loaded initially what did this for us is that our vendor bundle was reduced just by this one change by 20 kb gzip you know so we were, we didn't want to load the polyfill when the actual code isn't there, you don't want its polyfill to be there initially. So that's what this thing did. However, uh, just an important disclaimer, use built-ins usage flag is currently experimental. So we did a thorough functional testing to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we did a thorough functional testing to ensure we were not breaking things by using this. Okay, so beyond uh, app code, uh, we a couple of things, I'll just walk through these quickly. One is improved HTTP caching. So it was interesting. We had, uh, you know, our HTTP cache uh, headers expiry around a month because we did uh, push to production every fortnight. So we always thought, okay, we would be pushing to prod every fortnight. So we don't need, uh, you know, stuff to be there uh, for more than a month. However, it's important to understand the way split chunks within Webpack 4 works is that it wants your vendor bundle to be similar unless you do newer third party libraries coming into your code, you know, for a longer duration. So we uh, had our vendor bundle lasting for longer. We, with this change, we kind of, so we changed it to be there for a year. And with this change, our vendor bundle would be in cache for longer and thus, you know, helps returning users. Uh, we also brought in broadly compression. So broadly compression essentially allows you to, we, it allowed us to reduce the bundle size by 20 to 25%. Okay, so uh, just the performance gains that we achieved, just walk through these quickly. Uh, so I mentioned the initial sizes, right? So we, I think we reduced, so the first two graphs are gzip to gzip, and we also uh, brought in broadly compression. So we, with broadly compression in place, I think we reduced the JS bundle size by around 50% uh, overall. Okay, so these are the three routes, that, this is what we measured, and the timings. So this is the timing gain that we had. Uh, I think 30 to 40 percent across three routes is the gain that we were able to make with all the earlier conditions. So we measured again with all the same conditions. Okay, so this is the speed index number here. And yeah, that's about it from my side. Uh, questions? I, I don't know if we have time for questions. Uh, thanks, Tejesh. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, any questions?